वेलकम टू अनादर सेशन ऑफ फिजियो टीवी आई एम डॉक्टर वेदांत बल्ला सेकेंड ईयर मास्टर इन स्पोर्ट्स फिजिकल थेरेपी फ्रॉम संचेती इंस्टीट्यूट फॉर ऑर्थोपेडिक एंड रिहेबिलिटेशन कॉलेज ऑफ फिजियोथेरेपी टूडेज टॉपिक ऑफ फिजियो टीवी इज रनिंग बायोमेकैनिक्स ना वी वील सी अबाउट द बायोमेकैनिक्स ऑफ द रनिंग वाई द बायोमेकैनिक्स ऑफ द रनिंग इज इंपॉर्टेंट In any sports, running is a fundamental basic movement of the most of the sports. So it is important to know about the biomechanical analysis of the running. Now, objectives of this topic will be to understand the phases of the running, to understand the kinetic and kinematic analysis of the running, and what are the common injuries occurring in the running. Now, running cycle phases and the sub phases. now running phases are divided into two main phases the first phase is support or the stance phase and the second phase is the recovery or the flight phase now these two phases again subdivided into sub phases stance phase is again divided into foot strike mid support and the take off as we can see in the diagram and the flight phase is divided into forward swing and the foot descent now we can see the distribution of the stance and the swing phase in this diagram the stance phase constitute of 40% of the running phases the swing phase constitute of 30% now we can see there is a double floating phases which constitute total of 15% which is occurring in between stance and the swing phase now floating phase if we compare the normal gait of the human locomotion to the running by running cycle there is a replacement of the double support phase which is replaced by the double floating phase the double floating phase in which no none of the foot is in contact with the ground while in the normal gait pattern or the gait cycle of the human locomotion one of the foot is always in contact with the ground now the double float phase is an important phase in the running cycle is to generate the momentum and to generate the velocity in the running bike now the stance phase is again divided into initial contact the mid stance and the toe off and the swing phase is divided into the initial swing the mid swing and the uh, terminal swing now moving forward the kinematic that is the range of motion occurring during the running at the hip knee and the ankle again we if we compare the angle of which forms during the normal locomotion or the normal gait pattern of the human locomotion to the running biomechanics we can see the hip knee and the ankle range of motion is slightly increased than compared with the normal gait pattern of the human locomotion now from the foot stride to the foot descent that is the whole cycle of the running the hip knee and ankle range of motion is increases the table shows a normal ideal range of motion occurring in the running phases but this angle can change from person to person now moving forward we'll see about the angle and the base of the gait as running velocity increases the angle and the base of the gait will be decreased with faster running the angle of the gait approaches to the zero the angle uh, the base angle of the base in the normal gait which is wider which we can see in the diagram a and with the faster running the angle of gait which is approaching zero and foot strike which is a uh, strike on the line of progression so in the diagram b we can see the angle and the base of the gait while running the foot is striking on the line of progression in the running this limits the deviation of center of mass as the lower limbs move beneath the body thus allowing more efficient locomotion so this is a normal physiology in the normal physiological motion happening now why this angle and the base of support is decreasing and why foot is striking on the line of progression this is because of this functional limb varus this is normal functional limb varus which is defined as angle between the bisection of the lower leg and the floor so we can see the functional limb varus while walking and the while running so while running the functional limb varus is increases up to 10 degrees during running which can increases valgus stresses at the knee and the pronation of the foot this is normal physiology normal physiological functional limb varus is only 10 degree if this functional limb varus increases more than 10 degrees it can be a pathological or it can create an injuries to the lower limb now what are the rare foot motion during run we can see in this short video the rare foot motion which is movement of the calcaneus in relation to the lower one third of the leg now it is seen that 
while running, there is a greater foot pronation than the walking. Now, why this greater foot pronation is important? This greater foot pronation is important to absorb the ground reaction forces from the uh, surface. Now, the early pronation is occurring between the foot strike and the mid support of the stance phase and the late pronation, which is occurring during the mid support up to the takeoff phase. Now, this rear foot motion, that is slight pronation of the rear foot is normal physiology. Okay, This is normally occurring in the during running. Now, foot biomechanics. We all know the windlass mechanism. The windlass mechanism comes to play while running after a heel off phase. So after a heel off phase, this windlass mechanism comes. In the normal foot or the normal resting foot, this windlass inactive mechanism provides the cushioning effect. But while the during that uh, after the heel off phase, this windlass active mechanism is happening, which provides the rigid structure for the propulsion. What, what is happening in this phase? The metatarsal extension increases the tension on the plantar fascia and the forces the transverse tarsal joint into flexion, which increases the stability at the push-off phase. So this windlass mechanism is important for the stability at the push-off phase. Now, what are the kinetic of the running? Now, influence of the ground reaction forces. Now, we all know the ground reaction forces. The ground reaction forces increases during running two to three times the body weight during the running, which is very great. The shock attenuation during running. Now, this ground reaction forces has to be impeded. So, how this ground reaction forces get attenuated? The shock attenuation during running is created by the movement at the lower extremity articulations, which we can see in the diagram B, which causes shortening of the lower limb. So, in the B diagram, the second one, the shortening of the lower limb is occurring to absorb these ground reaction forces. And this energy is absorbed by the contraction of the musculature as well surrounding the joint to lower the to the of the lower extremity. So two things happening to attenuate the ground reaction force. First one is shortening of the lower extremity. And second one is the energy is absorbed by the contracting of the surrounding muscles, that is the lower extremity muscles. Now there are types of the foot strike. So there are main three types of the foot strike. The first one is a rear foot striker, mid foot strike and the fore foot strike. As name suggests, a rear foot strike in which there is a posterior one third of the shoe strikes first the ground. Mid foot striker in which middle one third of the shoe or the foot is strike the ground first. And the fore foot striker that is anterior one third of the foot or the shoes strike the ground. Now this classification is important. Why this is important we will see in the next slides. Now in the research, they suggest that the rear foot striker, that is the heel is striking first to the ground, which demonstrate a double peak vertical ground reaction component of the ground reaction force. Whereas mid foot striker having only single peak vertical ground, ground reaction forces. Now in the second right side diagram, we can see the foot striking pattern, rear foot striker and the mid foot striker. The rear foot striker pattern the, you can see there is a double peak vertical ground reaction forces is occurring and in the forefoot or the midfoot striker, there is only one peak vertical force which is acting on the foot. Now figure 13.7, we can see the pattern of the rear foot striker and the midfoot striker, the contact of the foot which is in contact with the ground. Now it is important for the rear foot striker to see that the ground reaction forces, the peak of the ground reaction forces occurring two times in the foot. And in while in the rear foot striker, only single peak vertical ground reaction forces is occurring. So one study on competitive collegiate runners suggests that runners with a rear foot striker pattern develop more repetitive overuse injuries when compared with a runner with a four foot pattern. As we already discussed that in rear foot striker, there is a ground reaction forces acting twice. Okay, so this is not harmful. So uh, midfoot striker and forefoot striker having less chances of the injuries. Now, what are the muscle activities during running? We already discussed that muscle activity is important to attenuating this ground reaction forces. Now, EMG studies shows increased muscle action during running in comparison with the walking. So normal walking gait cycle, the muscle action is happening, but in the running, the muscle action is increased. So you add the heat joint during forward swing, hip joint flexors showing a greater EMG activity than the swing phase of the gait cycle. Rectus femoris, which is an active during early support phase and then diminishes towards the end of the support phase. Now the gluteus maximus, which demonstrate the EMG activity early in the foot descent period. And this activity continues to the first 40% of this support phase. 
Now heat adductors shows an increased EMG activity throughout the entire support phase, whereas heat abductors shows similar EMG activity during running. Now we already discussed about the normal functional limb virus. So the hip adductor shows an increased EMG activities here. Now at the knee joint, the quadriceps muscle is very active at the foot strike for the rapid loading. So quadriceps muscle is an important for the shock attenuation or the GRF uh, attenuation forces. So quadriceps activity is at peak during early support phase as to facilitate the shock attenuation process as the hip, knee and the ankle joint undergo flexion to create a shortening of the load extremity. Now the hamstring muscle. The hamstring muscle have been shown to be an active from before the foot strike until the hip joint complete its period of extension later in the support phase as it is responsible for slowing. Now the, here the hamstring role is very, very important. Hamstring role or hamstring is responsible for slowing the rapidly extending limb in the preparation of the foot loading. So hamstring having eccentric, uh, eccentric action while in the running phases. So hamstring is an important muscle to control the rapidly knee extension. So it has an eccentrically active here. Now ankle joint. The tibialis anterior muscle has been shown to be both active as well as absent from the foot strike until the foot is planted to the lump. Why this is happening? Uh, we already discussed the foot strike pattern. So this absence of the activity is due to differences in the foot strike pattern by this runner. So if foot striker is a midfoot or the forefoot striker, the tibialis anterior is not needed. But if in the rear foot striker, the tibialis anterior has to be active, actively contract. And in the rear foot striker, the tibialis anterior muscle to contract eccentrically to allow the smooth plantar flexion. A midfoot striker would not need the muscular contraction for the support. During the late portion of the support phase, activity of the triceps sole, that is the calf muscles, continues and helps to propel the runner's body into the air. So again, calf and tibialis anterior are the two important muscles acting on the ankle joint. Now, while see the analysis of a running, we have to see the foot inclination angle. The first one, A diagram shows the relatively high foot inclination angle in comparison with the horizontal line. And the B diagram shows a relatively low foot inclination angle. Now, this increase in the foot inclination angle was found to be related to the higher peak knee extensor movement, increased knee energy absorbed, higher peak vertical ground reaction forces, and the greater barking impulse during the running. So, there is a no cutoff at which this angle is determined to be normal. Lower values are generally associated with lower ground reaction forces and the joint kinetic and the vice versa. So, if an athlete is having a foot inclination angle which is increased, the risk of injury is again more. But if the values of the foot inclination angle is lower, there is a less chance of the uh, overuse injuries in this round of population. Now the TB angle is important. Now we can see in this diagram there are three TB angles, the extended TB angle, vertical TB angle and the flex TB angle. So for runner that suffers from uh, impact related injuries, the extended TB is not ideal as it increases the ground reaction forces. A vertical or the flex tibia, which reduces the range of motion or the lower extremities, which allows the runner to dissipate the impact more readily through this knee flexion. So this extended tibia angle is not ideal, but vertical and the flex tibia angle is important or it is useful to reduce the risk of the uh, stress-related injuries. Now trunk lean. Uh, a diagram shows a relatively upright trunk lean and B shows the runner with forward trunk lean. So a recent article by the Teng and Powers demonstrated that small increase in the trunk lean resulted in a significant lowering the stress across the patellofemoral joint without a significant increase in the ankle lean. So this article suggests that this strategy that is done slightly increase in the trunk lean angle may be important for the runners with patellofemoral pain. Now hip extension angle. Now the A diagram shows a normal hip extension angle, but the in diagram B shows a reduced or limited hip extension angle. Now what happens if the hip extension angle is reduced? There will be an increase in lumbar spine extension. There will be an increase in the bound, which is a strategy to increase the float time, to increase the overall stride length of, uh, stride length of the running cycle. It also increases the overstriding, including excessive reaching during initial contact as a strategy to increase the stride length. And fourth one is increased cadence to increase the running speed in the presence of limited hip extension. 
Thus, the reduced hip extension leads to a higher impact loading and the bracking forces leading to injury. So if there is a runner with an restricted hip extension, we have to work on the hip extension as it is important. Now, the stride length is important. So increased stride length, that is an overstriding, has been found to be associated with an increased risk of TBL stress fracture. Why? Look at the diagram B. There is an increase in the stride length. There will be there is an uh, extended TBL, which is not ideal. We already discussed. So overstriding measured at the loading response, so which is not ideal. So overstriding should not happen as it is increase the risk of TBL stress fracture. Now foot pronation. We already know there is a physiologically uh, foot pronation occurring during the running. That is heel eversion. So A diagram shows a runner with normal alignment of the heel during the running, and the B the runner with an excessive ankle or heel eversion. So this uh, increase in the eversion at the heel strike, it is an increased risk of the lower extremity injuries. Now moving forward to the running related injuries that are common running related injuries. We first understand the load deformation curve to explain the running injuries. Now we all know that run, uh, load deformation curve. So every tissue has a capability to withstand certain amount of forces or certain amount of tension. Beyond that, it fails. So in this graph, we can see there are three regions, elastic region, plastic region, and in between, there is a micro failure zone. Now, every athlete body responds to this impact related injuries differently. Now, every athlete having its capacity to withstand the load, withstand the intensity. If an athlete continues to load their lower extremities or continues to uh, run the, with a higher intensity, with higher volume, the tissue at the lower extremities, which is uh, uh, continues from the elastic range to micro failure zone, which can lead to an injuries because it is going from the elastic range to micro failure zone and the plastic region. So every tissue of every athlete have different capacity to bear this loading. So we must see an athlete individually for the running related injuries. Now, what are the common running related injuries occurring in the running population? Now, according to this article 2020, these are the 10 commonest running injuries occurring uh, in the athletic population. The common running injuries are the anterior knee pain, which is patellofemoral pain or the patella tendinopathy, the iliotibial band syndrome, plantar fasciitis, tibia stress syndrome or the stress fracture, meniscal injuries, Achilles tendinopathy, gluteus medius injuries, spinal injuries, hamstring injuries, and the metatarsalgia. So these are the common running related injuries which can occur due to an abnormal biomechanics of the athlete or it can occur due to an repetitive overuse injuries of the athlete. So these are the common uh, injuries. To, to know the mechanics or to know the causes of these uh, common running related injuries, we must know first the biomechanics of the running. Now, these are the references for this uh, running related biomechanics. Thank you for kind listening. Thank you Physio TV for giving me this opportunity. Thank you Dr. Parak Sanchiti sir. Thank you Dr. Apurva Shimpi sir for giving me this opportunity and giving me this opportunity to present this topic. Thank you.